Thank you very much for uh, Gudrun for this uh, introduction. Thanks both Kirsten uh, and both uh, Hungarian ambassadors for this hospitality opportunity for this, I would say, continuous dialogue because I was here for something similar time ago and I was here in the city to meet, uh, for example, in December in uh, Kanzleramt, uh, Patriarchs from Middle East. Uh, I think we are in the right time, in the right place, of course, very dynamic, which means uh, when I left Bratislava, government was still in place, but when we came here, it's not. But this is test of your democracy, and democracy is not tested during holidays or sunshines, but in difficulties, difficulties. And it's important to show for Austrians and for Europe that democracy here works, delivers, and prospects are, are coming or growing, not only for stability, but for good policies. And one of them is also my or our, I, I also appreciate the term mission, mission, humanity. I like Schumann, and Schumann said, uh, dreamt, uh, spoke about his vision for Europe, and one of the points was leader of humanity, united Europe as a leader of humanity. Another point was, Example of universal solidarity. The third one was holder of its destiny, not divided, not subdued by the powers, but united. And the fourth point of Schumann, Schumann's message was Europe, cradle of democracy, should be protector of democracy in the world, because democracy needs this sort of protection. And, and sense of this protection is Humanity, human life, human rights, and dignity for all, not just for some, for majorities. And I'm here also with the mission which is unique, first time ever, European Union Special Envoy for promotion of freedom of religion or belief outside of the Union, a bit long, but very precise. Religion and belief, which means for religious people and non-religious, which is about dignity for all, about freedom to, of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, including change of religion, which is not so easy in many parts of the world. Outside means, of course, inside we have internal systems, constitutional, but also European convention, etc. But we cannot have dichotomy or two faces, one external, one internal. We need to embrace for freedom of religion or belief as the human right, as very special, extensive human right, because without freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, there is no freedom of opinion, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of, of uh, association. So this is core of human rights. This is litmus test of human rights. I'm not putting this above, but into the center of the whole list of human rights. It's very close to human dignity. This country is, is strongly linked to Catholic uh, tradition. The major document of the Second Vatican Council on, human, on, uh, on religious freedom is called Dignitatis Humanae. So human dignity and religious freedom are interlinked totally together. And um, that's why I say for freedom of religion is important. I'm here because there were many people, persons, families paying a bloody price for this awakening of Europe of Europeans, not only business as usual, not only single market, Euro, Schengen, but also freedom of religion or belief. It is fruit of martyrdom in Syria and in Iraq, because when this bloodshed demonstrated publicly, openly, as, as uh, ideology, as a threat or, or policy towards the others, towards the different, was seen in Europe uh, Somehow, after two years of debates or reflections, then decision came in the European Parliament to denounce uh, these mass atrocities as genocide, which is a very important word. But this word means commitment, not only you know, text or kind of expression. It's international law commitment. And then many other uh, parliaments or, or bodies declared what's going on under ISIS in Syria and Iraq represents genocide. Again. Again. And we don't know whether again in future, but hope less or not. Because it's important to prevent 
to prevent, not only to declare that there was Armenian genocide or Holocaust genocide or Bosnian, Rwanda, but really to stand for humanity. And Europe should play more important or, or um, influential role. So that's why I am here, because there was genocide, not because we have lobbying or we somehow wake up. Yes, but many people, thousands, paid the highest price for our awakening. So let's do a proper job. I'm in this position three years, so it's a question of what will happen now after Sunday, after these elections, after new commission is there, new parliament, whether it, it's just a period of tests or, or uh, kind of pioneering or a commitment for lasting, stable and efficient promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief in the world. This is our interest also to, to eliminate threats, uh, to, to prevent conflicts, to promote humanity, to promote sustainable development, to avoid an additional wave of refugees to Europe because we didn't care enough or we didn't care in time. So what is a persecution? Just a few reflections to be, uh, let's say, on one level. Religious persecution is the systematic mistreatment of an individual or a group or community as a response to their religious beliefs of affili or affiliations or a lack thereof. So even for lack of religious uh, affiliation, there can be persecution and there, there is such situation in many countries, so-called religious countries. Uh, religious persecution may be triggered by either bigotry on the local uh, level, religious bigotry, members of a dominant group denigrating uh, religions other than their own, or by the state, when the state views a particular religious group as a threat to its interests or security. And this is also reality in many countries, including Europe, unfortunately, including Europe. Look to Russia. Uh, religious persecution is defined as violence or discrimination against religious minorities, actions intending to deprive political rights and force minorities to either assimilate or leave or live as second-class citizens. And examples of persecution are many different difficult confiscation, destruction of property, incitement to hate, arrest, imprisonment, beatings, torture, murder, or execution. So really, religious persecution is opposite to form, to freedom of religion or belief. Um, third point, Christian situation. Yes, it's true, Christians are the most persecuted community worldwide today. One logical part of the answer is because they represent the highest numbers. But, but secondly, they are many frequently, frequently uh, uh, persecuted because they are seen as agents of the West or somebody who is not loyal to the community or to the society. Uh, persecution of Christians uh, is uh, studied by, by many uh, institutions, organizations, one of them I have some numbers from, uh, from Pew Research Center, tells very openly that Christians have been harassed in more countries than any other religious group. And they have suffered harassment in many of the Muslim-majority countries in the Middle East and North Africa. That's reality. John Allen, writer, speaks about, in his book, a global attack, or global war against Christians, on high numbers, up to 100,000 Christians being killed annually for their faith, just for the faith, not for, because there is kind of a, a war situation. Um, I'm sure maybe you, you uh, got information, there is now a report, uh, a review uh, underway in United Kingdom, uh, ordered by the uh, Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, on uh, Christian persecution in the world, it's not uh, published in full uh, text yet, but, but what was already uh, preliminary uh, described or declared, review estimates that Christians were the most persecuted religious group. Political correctness and trade interests play part uh, in this issue. 
and the report says the persecution of Christians is at near genocide. Again, mentioning genocide as something near in the modern civilized world. But I want to say, and that's principle, that usually uh, persecution doesn't uh, cover or target only one minority. It's always very large, very diverse. As we see in Syria and Iraq, uh, not only Christians, but also Yazidis, Shia Muslims, and other minorities suffer from discrimination, harassment, persecution. There are plenty of examples in Pakistan, not only Christians, but also Ahmadis suffer as well as Shias. In Sudan, Sufis. In Iran, Baha'is. In Myanmar, Rohingyas. They are persecuted by Buddhist nationalists. In China, it's Falun Gong and Uyghurs. In India, several minorities suffer discrimination. North Korea, all people of faith uh, suffer from cruel dictatorship. So if society, if society allows for the persecution of one minority, it lays the ground for the persecution of other minorities. And to be really uh, comprehensive and, and inclusive, a problem of four, freedom of religion or belief, really comprise also non-believers, secular people. Many of them suffer. There are 13 countries in the world with capital punishment for atheism. 22 countries in the world with capital punishment for conversion from one belief to, to, to the other. More than 70 countries with blasphemy laws. So uh, this is not easy time, easy, it's easy world for freedom of thought, freedom of conscience. And uh, we should do more for this freedom because it's the civilizational issue, the civilizational criterion and objective. What is uh, Europe doing? Uh, somehow I already started to, to explain there is special envoy, first time ever. I hope it will be something institutionalized, not linked to Jan Figel or now, but something institutionally anchored, integrated, and not only well placed, by, but efficient for the purpose, for the support of persecuting, persecuted people, and for uh, policies which are supporting freedom of religion or belief. Secondly, uh, in the European Union, we have already uh, several uh, good signals. One of them is consensus of nowadays 28 countries on framework or guidelines, <clears throat> the, look, the rules for diplomacy, how to deal with uh, freedom of religion, uh, religious, uh, religion or, or, or belief in the world. Uh, it's in place since 2013, but we need to use it, not only to have it. There was intergroup, first time ever in these five years, in the European Parliament dealing with freedom of religion or belief and religious tolerance. We need continuity and even stronger group, maybe covering not only a uh, situation outside, but also in Europe, dealing with this uh, with, with uh, real synergy and integrity. Um, I'm sure we uh, need to put together resources and um, interests of the Union and Member States. Good example of Hungary and uh, several examples from the recent years are encouraging because since I was nominated in May 20, 2016, there was a decision in Hungary that year, later on uh, special envoys or ambassadors or uh, departments have been created in several countries like Germany, United Kingdom, Denmark, Lithuania, this summer we expect something to be announced in Netherlands. So it's good to have such visible uh, diplomats or politicians dealing with this issue, but we need to work together for the uh, sake of those who suffer. Um, last, not, not least, but I'm unsure that uh, religious literacy, religious awareness is part of our uh, situation. Much more need to be done in this, uh, in this uh, front. Everybody now knows uh, or, or commands digital literacy. Um, many mobiles in the pockets or, or in the hall. But we need not only smartphones, but we need smart people who use smartphones to share information, 
to share action, to mobilize, and really uh, to make this 21st century more human, especially on, on, on freedom of religion or belief. I'm here to not only to speak, but also to listen. Again, I'm grateful that this forum is uh, organized, uh, but we need to deliver. We need to do more than just to meet. But thank you for being together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jan Fiegel. And I think the applause that you heard is for what you said, and it's also for what you represent and what you have done on a personal level. Because you can fill an office by filling it, or you can give everything, and we see you doing this. And we take, I think, as one very clear political recommendation from what you have said, that the new European Commission needs to not only prolong your office as a special envoy, but also make it a real institution with a budget and with institutional connection that it needs. And I do hope that the governments that we can talk to will support this idea. Thank you very much, Mr. Fiegel.